Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to be here in week four of our California road trip adventure for the Harvest at Home series celebrating California Wine Month. It has been such a such a fun month to explore all of the great wine producing regions here in California. And once again, I am here. I'm Amanda McCrossan and I am joined by a wonderful, wonderful human being who is going to tell us so much about the region that we're talking about today. I'm here with Brandon Sparks Gillis, who is the winemaker and owner at Dragonette Cellars and also a master of wine candidate. So he is incredibly set up and prepared to deep dive into all the things that make Santa Barbara amazing. So welcome. Thanks for having me. We're going to have some fun today. I think so. Yeah. And you're in Santa Barbara right now, right? I'm sitting in the town of Los Olivos right now. Yeah, right at the heart of Santa Barbara wine country. Oh, my God. Did you grow up there? I did not. No, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest and took, you know, wine kind of captivated me at an early age. So took a very circuitous journey, as a lot of us do, kind of around the globe, working in different regions, working in retail, production and vineyards. And Santa Barbara captivated my attention so much that about 15 years ago, um, moved here and ended up starting Dragonette with two of my good friends and partners. Wow. How cool is that? Has it been um, a big change from the Pacific Northwest or like, you know, what are some of the differences? It has. And one of the greatest ironies is that, you know, everyone thinks of the Pacific Northwest as being cold and rainy. And as yeah. you know, being <laughs> up there is actually the opposite. It's a hot, parched desert. So in fact, I think it's kind of the, this interesting irony that I went south to get cooler. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's unusual. So what's the temperature there right now? So today we're actually bumping up into a little bit of a, a warm warming trend. So here in Los Olivos, we're about 90 degrees. But out in Lompoc, uh, we'll kind of talk geography here in a minute, but out in the kind of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay country, I think the high temperature today is going to be more like 72 or 73. So, I mean, there's really incredible diversity. Wow. That's a pretty big swing from, and what's the, how far away is that again? And the distance you know, from here to there is about 25 miles. Yeah. So as the crow flies in Santa Barbara, we'll talk about the geography in a minute, but the temperature can change about one degree per mile. So as you go from end to end across the valley, it can be super, super dramatic. Oh, that's very cool. You know, I have some preconceived notions about Santa Barbara myself, having grown up in the East Coast and heard about people vacationing up in Santa Barbara, like, you know, all the cool LA people are like, we're going to Santa Barbara for the weekend. I guess it's the same thing if people live in San Francisco, they go to Napa. Yeah, for the Napa. It always seemed a little bit fancier in Santa Barbara for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, it's the Hollywood crowd, the beaches. <laughs> the beaches. But, yeah, so Santa Barbara is actually, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. I mean, it has the reputation for a reason. Yeah, is so food scene wise, lots to do, lots to see, lots to eat. It is, but on a on a very much more laid back sort of style. I mean, it's interesting that we're so close to Los Angeles, but I think the majority of folks who come up from Los Angeles love the idea of actually getting away, coming to a place that's much more agricultural, much more wild. I mean, we're surrounded by ocean, and mm. I mean, literally the Pacific Ocean wraps all around Santa Barbara County, and so I mean, it's a place that you know we have we have cool weather, we have wonderful beaches really great people and really, really diverse agricultural traditions as well. So that's one thing you talk about the food scene. The food scene here is sort of the quintessential stereotypical farm to table thing. I mean, in many <laughs> ways, it's literally from the farm to the table that day. Oh, I mean, it, it always seemed that way in my mind. And then also just knowing what foods come from there. And interestingly, Fridays, I do a series on Instagram on California Wines Channel with Aida Mullenkamp, who takes over California Grown, and it's been this What Grows Together Goes Together series. Oh, really? Um, and I just, you know, Santa Barbara, I mean, California in general just embodies that so much, but I always think about Santa Barbara as being one of the epitomes of that adage. It's so true, because there's so many different things to choose from, and we have both the land and the sea right here. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got three wines to taste this afternoon, but I want to talk a little bit about Santa Barbara as a region before we start diving into those. So I read that, uh, say, well, the the like slogan on Santa Barbara's website, which I thought was so cute, was West of France and just north of LA. Um, <laughs> so do you, I mean, do you have any like insight into that? Because I think it's such a funny thing that they have up in there. Is that like a common thing? It is. Well, so it, that's actually sort of a, that debuted this year. So they were trying to kind of think of a clever way to talk about Santa Barbara. And the reason the reasoning behind that is the kind of the, the proximity to the France thing is we have this world-class wine region filled with in, in an incredible diversity. And, you know, we'll, that'll be kind of the theme of what we talk about today. But I mean, there's just an incredible diversity of grapes and wines that are grown and made here. But it is truly just north of L.A. I mean, it's literally depending on where you are in the Los Angeles area, folks can actually get up here. I mean, especially with COVID style traffic in like an hour, hour and a half. So oh, yeah. I mean, really a very, very quick getaway. But as I mentioned before, it's worlds apart. 
I mean, so it's something where, you know, we have wide open spaces, you know, we have incredibly beautiful beaches, incredibly beautiful mountains. I mean, it's kind of rugged. It's kind of mountain sea with really cool little quaint hamlets. I mean, where I'm sitting here in Los Olivos is this town, an analog in the north, it'd be kind of like a miniature version of Healdsburg, you know, where you have just this beautiful okay. little town with a little square, tons of great tasting rooms, great restaurants, you know, and all kind of compressed into one little spot. And when we think of grapes and wines being produced in Santa Barbara, we should be thinking what? So that is that is the million dollar question. And it's interesting in Santa Barbara because it's a hard one to answer. So one of the things <laughs> that we're famous for is our diversity. And from a storytelling perspective, sometimes that can be a little bit tricky. But what I'd say is when you think of, of the, the coastal influence here, and I mentioned that one degree per mile difference, you think about it in a 30 mile stretch and you have a 30 degree temperature differential, you could have one side of the valley where the high temperatures are in the 70s in, in August and September at the peak of the growing season, the other side of the valley where it pokes up towards the high 90s. So you really can grow a lot of different grapes. You know, So there's over 70 different grapes that are successfully grown in Santa Barbara. And that sounds just absolutely crazy. And I remember I myself, before I came to Bar Santa Barbara, was thinking, ah, maybe they're a young region, they don't know what they're doing. But really when you get here, you realize there's so many cool, unique microclimates and the, the soil diversity here is quite wide as well. So there's a match for a number of different grapes. But what I'd say, you know, today, I think that we should focus on the real quintessential grapes of Santa Barbara, which if you had to distill it down to a mere handful, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Syrah would be the top. You know, the top three planted grapes around here. And they're also three of the grapes that have really, you know, made Santa Barbara famous for wine. And that said, I mean, I have to give a quick shout out that, I mean, there's wonderful Bordeaux varieties, you know, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Sauvignon out in Happy Canyon. There's tremendously fun, interesting varieties, little things like Gamay and experimental things that are happening in, in Los Alamos or different spots. Um, but really Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and Syrah are the three things that really have, have begun to make Santa Barbara shine on the world stage. Well, it's a good thing we're tasting those three wines today then, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be tasting Sauvignon Blanc tomorrow on our IG Live. Uh, actually, you're Sauvignon Blanc, the Dragonette uh, from Happy Canyon. Awesome. Yeah, that's that, that. And those four things really kind of bookend the region. I mean, in terms of having Chardonnay and Pinot Noir from the real Western areas that are very close to the ocean, Bordeaux varieties over towards Happy Canyon, which is kind of unique AVA on the Eastern side. And then Syrah is a bit of a chameleon. It can actually do well almost anywhere in the Valley, but kind of in the heart of the Valley, like in the San Inez yeah. Valley, Los Alamos, Alisos Canyon, Ballard Canyon, those are areas that are just spot on for Syrah. Well, I want to get some wine uh, in our mouths because I'm thirsty, number one. Um, but mm -hmm. also, uh, I would love to use that as a way to maybe paint the picture uh, with your map to see kind of where, yeah. where we're going to bounce around a little bit today. So up first, we've got the Fox and Chardonnay 2017 from the Biancito Vineyard. Um, so this was actually a recommendation when I had... I. I I know uh, surface level about Santa Barbara, definitely not the way that I know Napa Valley. Um, so I, I utilize your expertise in selecting some of these wines uh, that we're gonna be tasting today. So Foxen was on your list. Um, any particular reason why? For sure, so the, and this wine is really special in the sense that to me it unites two of my, my kind of favorite families, if you will, in Santa Barbara County. So Foxen is a partnership between two families. Their history goes all the way back to the Spanish land grant days. So really wonderful people who've been farming in Santa Barbara County for a long time. And that's one thing that I mentioned that diversity of agriculture. You do see a number of producers here whose family might have been, you know, raising cattle or you know, growing row crops even a generation ago or whatnot, who have incorporated wine grapes into what they're doing. So mm -hmm. the Doré family of the Fox and brand, they were some of those folks who've been around a long time. And then the Miller family of Bien Nacido Vineyard are also essentially pioneers to the area and really, I mean, incredible people who've done a lot to put Santa Barbara on the map. So I thought having that vineyard and that brand together would be a really fun way to kick things off. Yeah, I love it. And um, so my first question is, and it's interesting because I've tasted a number of different California Chardonnays and certainly throughout the series, we've tasted a number of different California Chardonnays, but there is to me, uh, at least anecdotally, there is to me something very distinct about the Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara Chardonnay. Um, and I wonder if you can maybe talk a little bit about what some of those distinctions might be. Absolutely, and what I wanna do here, I'm gonna actually pop up the map because I think this is gonna be a fun kind of entree into that and talk yeah. about why Santa Barbara is so unique for Chardonnay. <clears throat> so again, I mean, Chardonnay has grown all around the world very prominently within California. Mm -hmm. And just a second here. I'll... You see it up there? Uh, let's see here. Mm, there we go. Okay, so I want to. I'm gonna go ahead and share the map of Santa Barbara County. 
Great. And what we'll do, we'll start at the real high level and I'll give a, a quick overview here. So I wanted to start the slide with this to kind of show the actual entirety of Santa Barbara County and the wine growing areas. And if you look at the map, I think one quick thing to give us context. So where we are, we're technically in the southern third of California. But that said, Santa Barbara County itself, it, it doesn't necessarily bear resemblance to, San, to Southern California as we think of in terms of a place with beaches and palm trees and warm weather. <laughs> so you can see where Santa Barbara sits surrounded by the cold Pacific Ocean. And the wine on our glass right now is the, from the Santa Maria Valley. So that is one of our AVAs kind of on the northwest quarter of Santa Barbara County. And the reason that that's so critical, so the Santa Maria AVA and then the Santa Rita Hills AVA, which we'll talk about in a moment, both of those are incredibly close to the Pacific Ocean. And the geographic feature that's super unique about Santa Barbara County is that we have <clears throat> east-west running mountain ranges. And I'm sure that we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. But I wanted to zoom out just a little bit here to kind of show that differential. And you can kind of see there's, there's mountains that flank us to the south and to the north. And what that does is it brings a cooling ocean influence in. So we have wind, fog, and just generally speaking, quite cool climate. And so the way that that relates to Chardonnay, when we get back to that, let's see here, pardon me just a second, I'm gonna. Yeah, no, so I didn't, I don't know why I didn't realize that the uh, the rain, the mountain ranges ran that way. And just so for everyone's edification, just so you know, basically in Napa and Sonoma, they run north to south. So it's incredibly unique what you're talking about for it to be, you know, the inverse of that. It's the only place from the tip of Alaska all the way down to Chile, where along the West Coast, we have that east-west orientation of the mountains. And the reason it's so important is that, as you say, in, in most of our areas, the coast ranges or the interior mountains go north to south. They block the ocean influence. Mm -hmm. Down here, the San Andreas Fault has tipped them on their side and rotated them 90 degrees. So the mountains are literally east-west, which draws that in. And the reason it's important for Chardonnay and also Pinot Noir, which we'll talk about in a moment, is that it, it provides this incredibly cool climate growing season. And we do, one of the things that we share with Southern California is a quite a long, sunny growing season. So our rainy season, when we do get it, tends to occur from late November into March. So we receive almost all of our rain during the winter, and that allows for this incredibly long growing season. And it is relatively dry, but moderated by that wind and the fog. And so for Chardonnay, what it does, the skins on the Chardonnay and the Pinot are around here because of that constant wind, that constant fog, and also that sunshine, but cool sunshine. So one of our favorite ways to describe that pioneer, Richard Sanford, who instigated what right. became San Reed Hills, he calls it refrigerated sunlight. Yeah, the sun shines on the on the vines and on the grapes, but it's a, but it's a cooler sun. But as a defense, the, the skins on the grapes, we're getting a little geeky here, but the skins on the grapes thicken up a little bit. Mm -hmm. You wind up both with Chardonnay and with Pinot Noir with slightly thicker skins than those grapes would have grown in most other places in the world. Mm -hmm. And for Chardonnay in particular, one of the hallmark signatures, you have that incredible, beautiful, fresh acidity mm -hmm. uh, that comes from the ocean influence. You have that pronounced fruitiness, which comes from that exposure to you know that long season with the sunlight. And then you have this tremendous balancing act between the two. And those thicker skins give you a little bit of grip on the palate too. So sometimes the Chardonnays will actually have a little bit of phenolics, which is the equivalent of kind of tannins to a white wine. And I think that's something that makes Santa Barbara Chardonnay really special. Yeah, I think you've just, I mean, obviously you've summed it up beautifully as you always do. And I, I encourage anyone who's watching, um, we will be able to get questions. Uh, Brandon is such a master with words and explaining very, very complicated subjects as I've learned in the past and you've broken things down beautifully for me, but you've just surmised essentially what I've been tasting, not only in this class, but in a lot of Santa Barbara Chardonnays and Pinots, which is that really tricky balance of having really bright, fresh acidity and that lift and that thing that sort of cleans up after itself. But then you also have this gorgeous weight and this texture. Um, so, you know, a lot of times with uh, with cooler climate Pinots and Chards, as I'm sure you've experienced, they can be a little lighter in their feet. They, you know, they kind of dance across your palate in a different way. This has a little bit more body and substance and ripeness. So you really get the best of all three worlds. You're not just looking at one versus another. It's it's such a beautiful um, juxtaposition. It's I, I, That's a great way to. Yeah. <laughs> that was such a cool way to describe it. I love that. <laughs> it's really, really good. I mean, I'm getting you know, all of that like great solidity, a little bit of that, like uh, that French sea salt, um, but then you get that that gorgeous California sunshine. So that lemon meringue, um, you know, those gorgeous little, uh, like uh, it's not quite green apple, but maybe like green apple that's been baked into a pie. So it has just a little bit more lushness to yeah, it. Um, spiciness and a little kind of tropical kick. And that's one of the things that Santa Maria to me does so beautifully. I mean, it just, it has such tremendous fruit expression, but like you say, it's never heavy. What is so interesting about this wine, um, and I think for people 
who love oak or don't love oak, this wine was actually 100% barrel fermented and it's all 100% new French oak. Um, and then it sat sur lees for eight months. So you're getting a lot of the texture in the way from here. But interestingly, um, you don't feel the oak, I think, in a way that you might expect from another Chardonnay that's seen as much oak treatment as it has. Is that normal? I mean, I know you make a Chardonnay for Dragonette. Uh, is, is the Chardonnay just capable of handling a little bit more oak? Yeah, de depending on the location of the vineyard, but in general, as you mentioned, the same sort of things that give the Chardonnay around here such unique configurations allow it to receive oak really well. And as you mentioned, if you have something that's really light on its feet, sometimes it's challenging for the oak to sit with the fruit and balance it. Uh, but here where we have, like you mentioned, that really remarkable texture to the wine, it tends to pair really, really well with oak. Um, that said, I mean, there are gorgeous unoaked uh, Santa Maria Chardonnays and Santa Barbara Chardonnays. Mm -hmm. There's gorgeous neutrally oaked Chardonnays. There's some cool concrete things. Um, but it, it tends to have this broad spectrum. And I think that's what makes Chardonnay such a magical grape is that, I mean, it, it's so adept at handling all these different winemaking techniques. Um, but around here, that that balancing act, and I think the acidity is really critical to that too. So it's something where too much new oak on a Chardonnay that isn't, you know, carrying a lot of acidity can sometimes whack things out of balance. Mm -hmm. But when you have just that laser-like bit of fresh acidity, that can really hold the oak in balance and, and make yeah. it something that is not the defining feature of the wine. You know, the fruit definitely to me stands out as the most important thing in the wine. I mean, it's, it's a gorgeous wine. It wants food, but it's also super delicious on its own. So... <laughs> Um, hard to put it down, but we do have Pinot to taste. Indeed. <laughs> Maybe we'll circle back to it, but uh, I love how you, how you, we we actually did a video together not too long ago, actually probably right when COVID started um, via Zoom where you, you described Chardonnay and all of the wonders of Chardonnay and how technique can influence it and um, the way that you describe malolactic fermentation and how oak uh, can impart flavor on a on a Chardonnay was just masterful. So I'll after maybe after all this is done, I'll I'll comment below on this video and send, put that link out there because you do such a beautiful job talking about it. Yeah. Um, all right, Pinot Noir. This is uh, I don't know. Are you familiar with this wine? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Dragonette. This is the 2018 Pinot Noir from Santa Rita Hills. I'm going to get this in my glass right now. Um, Brandon, Pinot Noir in, in Santa Barbara, what should we be thinking about? So Pinot Noir in Santa Barbara is definitely, it's the most planted variety in the area up on the red side. And it really is a grape that, as we know, you know, it's almost the polar opposite to Chardonnay in one sense, where Chardonnay can be grown almost anywhere. Chardonnay does well in extremely cold climates and cool climates and kind of more moderate climates. It can grow in warmer areas. Pinot Noir is far, far more picky in particular. I mean, it really demands this kind of cool weather environment in order for the grape to kind of retain that combination of kind of kaleidoscopic intensity, but also nuance, finesse, and texture. So Santa Barbara is very important for that. So this is a grape that really thrives in those areas that are exposed to that pure ocean influence. So when you, when you think about Santa Barbara County for Chardonnay, places like Santa Maria Valley and Santa Rita Hills are really the two places where you know, it's found its real sweet spot. And that's something, I mean, this, this wine is actually kind of a, a fun nod to that because the main, this is a blend of seven different vineyards in Santa Rita Hills. And we'll kind of pop up the map and talk about that in a sec. Yeah. Uh, but the leading vineyard in it is Sanford and Benedict in the Santa Rita Hills. So that was the original plantings at the original vineyard in what became Santa Rita. So really kind of fun for us to be able to carry on the work of the pioneers and that's one of the things that's so fun about Santa Barbara County is that though there was some wine made way, way back in the olden days, when we really think of, of modern winemaking in Santa Barbara, it really got a foothold just over 40 years ago. Mm. And so we have this area where the true pioneers of the area, we have Kathy Joseph of Fiddlehead and Fiddlesticks Vineyard. We have Richard Sanford, Rick Longoria. Um, I, the, the list is so long, Lucas and the Long, <laughs> there's so many different people I'd love to talk about. But, you know, they came here for the purpose of, you know, finding a place that was essentially a little bit more wild. And Richard Sanford in particular was looking for that real Goldilocks combination, a place that had cool enough weather to grow Pinot Noir with a long enough season where it could successfully, successfully get ripe. And he found that in what eventually became the Santa Rita Hills. It's so interesting because we've, I, like Chardonnay, we've talked about Pinot Noir all over the state of California and everyone sort of, you know, believes that their region is best for whatever, for, for whatever reason that may be. Um, and, and certainly give uh, great reasons why. Certainly we talked about Calera and all of the limestone that exists in Mount Harlan. We talked about Sonoma uh, and, you know, sort of being coastline, but having the range to sort of protect it inland. Um, but here, you know, you're talking about a region that is very much coastal. So, 
Uh, what is it that makes Santa Rita or Santa Barbara, specifically Santa Rita Hills? I mean, if you've got the grapes that are that exposed to the coastal influence, do you not run a higher risk of it being more challenging? We do. Anybody who's farming Pinot Noir is a risk taker. I mean, it's definitely, it's a tricky grape to grow. It is you know, relatively thin skin, so it's susceptible to all sorts of different weather influences. And it is a, it's a very, very challenging grape to grow. What I think makes it so successful in Santa Barbara County and specifically in Santa Rita Hills is the fact, like I mentioned earlier, that the rain in our area comes primarily in the winter and outside of the growing season. And the reason that's important for Pinot Noir is that for a thin skin grape, rain can be something that can actually increase humidity and cause different molds and things like that. And so having a dry climate, but a cold, cool climate, those are the things that I think juxtapose to create this really beautiful you know, capability there. And it is an area that allows for this incredible diversity in Pinot Noir because you, you can sort of pick your harvest date in most years. I mean, there are folks around here who really want you know, to kind of mimic, you know, the kind of old school burgundy and make 12% alcohol Chardonnays, mm -hmm. they can do that. There's folks who want to really push the envelope and make blockbuster Pinot Noirs. They can pick, you know, four or five weeks later than the other crowd and they can do that. You know, I think that we fall kind of somewhere in between. We're really looking just for the essence of each vineyard. So it's not so much of a stylistic goal. It's more just expressing, you know, the season and the place. But Santa Barbara really affords that potential. So I think that's one thing where we feel really lucky and I should knock on wood. We do, of course, have to dodge things like wildfires like the state of California so unfortunately has this year. Um, but things like rain at harvest time are something that are extraordinarily rare. So we're able to ride that edge and have a grape that can take literally six months to truly ripen. But by the time that season of picking comes, the weather is typically phenomenal. So I mean, we've been picking Pinot Noir really extensively for the last two weeks. And almost every single pick has been under this beautiful, beautiful cover of fog. And so, you know, we're out there, we, we like to pick, all of our grapes are handpicked and, you know, we like to be there to sort the grapes at harvest. And I mean, just the other day we wrapped up a pick at 10 a.m. and it was still 55 degrees, literally oh. <laughs> covered in fog. And so it's hard to believe that in, in, in this time of year, I mean, in so many places in California, just a hundred miles inland, it'd be 90, hundred degrees. Yeah. But talking from the coast there, that blanket of fog really does magic. That is crazy. Um, it's interesting, all of the things that we talked about with it. Well, I guess it's not interesting. It's it's as you would expect, all of the things we were talking about with the Chardonnay with that that lift in the brightness, but then also that intensity of fruit um, and then depth of actual texture. Uh, same things apply to this Pinot Noir. And I think you you hit the nail on the head. This is not, um, you know, super light and you know, really after that, you know, that ass, that screaming acidity that that hits you first, but it's also not uh, leading fruit first uh, either. I mean, you're definitely getting D all of the above. And I think, again, it speaks to what we love about Santa Barbara, Barbara which is that combination of uh, California meets Burgundy. It's also not Oregon in a, a textural sense. Um, it very much is its own own thing. And I think it makes makes it so special. Um, and a region that I've been paying attention to for the last decade or so in my career, I remember the very, very first time I tasted uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir from Santa Barbara. And I was like, oh my goodness, this, like, how can this be possible? Because as a young sommelier, you're taught that Burgundy is one thing and California is another. And all of a sudden I tasted these, these penis and shards and I was like, wait a minute, somebody just blurred the lines. Like all the rules are gone. Like we just threw the rule book out the window. Like I have to start from square one again. <laughs> Which I think is fun. And that's one thing that, you know, Santa Barbara truly is a frontier. You know, I mentioned that the modern history here is pretty new. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been a lot of exploration. And one of the things there's, there's really phenomenal Pinot grown all up and down the state of California. I mean, you just name check Calera, one of our all time favorites. Yeah. I mean, Jensen, Reed, uh, they're, they're just the beautiful vineyards. Here in Santa Barbara, it, particularly in Santa Rita Hills, we have a really, really magical thing, which is our own soil type. So you can see some of the rock pile kind of behind me, and I've got some right here. Yes, so I love it. You mentioned that kind of earthiness within Santa Rita Hills Pinot Noir. And this is a stone called diatomaceous earth. So it's, it's actually texturally related to chalk. I mean, you could actually kind of just break it a piece. Okay, that's the one that's super, super you know, like super 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 um, But these are ancient ocean creatures, these little micro algae they actually have skeletons of silica rather than limestone. So diatomaceous earth is the name of it. You don't have to remember that. It's a hard thing to spell, but just know that that's one thing that makes Santa Barbara Pinot Noir so unique. And in particular, there's deposits of this in Santa Rita Hills that are just spectacular. So, you know, we really feel fortunate to be able to be part of these vineyards that are planted right on top of something that's totally unique. And as you know, talking to anybody in France, they're gonna talk about their terroir and you know, take <laughs> out, geek out on the dirt. And here we have something that's seen nowhere else in the world. And so we really like the idea of, 
expressing what's unique about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all about terroir, and and while all roads may lead back to Burgundy, California has certainly established itself as uh, one of the great places for Pinot Noir, and I think Santa Barbara, maybe more than any other region, is just leading that charge with people like you and um, Raj Parr, and you know, I just I love seeing all of the experimentation down there, but the commitment to being your own thing, uh, which yeah. is so special. Yeah, that's one of the things that I think is so neat about Santa Barbara across the variety is that because it's a place where, you know, we joke about this with our friends in France who say that the best thing that they can do is not screw up what their grandparents did. So they kind of get, <laughs> we have this Wild West era here where you can literally go out and, and actually explore. I mean, you can still, you talk about Raj, you know, the Domaine de la Cote, that vineyard is, is planted you know, that rock right there, right near a couple of our vineyards, you know, some of the vineyards that we work with, like Radian, and they're, they're vineyards that didn't exist 15 years ago. And we were able to find these spots that historically people thought, you know, were either too cool or too extreme to grow grapes. Now there's vineyards on them, they're producing some of the most phenomenal wines in California. So, I mean, it really is a, a fun place for exploration. And that exploration continues as you head across the valley into all sorts of different varieties. So I think it's a, a really fun place. So let's talk a little bit about this particular Pinot Noir and what you were doing to it. I also would love to know about the 2018 vintage. I know what it was like in Napa, but what was it like down in Santa Barbara? In Santa Barbara, I would describe it as being a classic vintage. So, you know, we always talk about our cool climate mm -hmm. and we had this drought in the kind of the few years preceding that where things did warm up a bit as, as they did in Napa. Yeah. Um, but 2018 saw a real return to form. I mean, so it was a year that we just saw incredibly cool weather conditions all year long. So to put it in perspective, in the vineyards where the Pinot Noir was grown, if you look at weather data for the summertime, the, the extent of the end of the growing season, we didn't have a single day above 72 degrees between July and harvest in September. No so way. Extraordinarily cool. I mean, that marine layer that we talk about coming in, yeah. uh, 18 was one of those vintages. It was the polar opposite. 2017 was one of the warmest vintages we've ever had, and harvest was go, go, go. Yeah. In 2018, it was one of those years where you literally, you have to be very patient because the grapes take their time, particularly mm -hmm. in, in the cooler areas like Santa Rita Hills. And so in 18, we were literally, I mean, it was one of our favorite harvests because we were sort of getting to just wait for the grapes to roll in. And so we'd go yeah. out and taste and test the berries. And it was the fun. It's really nice, you know, from a seller management standpoint of that, to be able to say, hey, we could pick tomorrow, we could pick the next day, and it won't be dramatically different. So yeah. occasionally you get vintage just like that. <laughs> it comes at once. But 18 was very beautiful. Yeah, very cool weather vintage. Still had that beautiful sort of couple hours of sunshine a day and, you know, very dry season as well throughout the actual part of the summertime. So, I mean, really a picture perfect growing season. So when did you actually pick, do you remember? Yeah, so in 18, we started picking, I, I don't know the exact date, but it would have been the kind of the first or second week of September, but we did not finish harvesting Pinot Noir until well into October. Wow. And then, and then Syrah that year, oh my gosh, we had to wait. I mean, it was literally, we were still picking the first week of November. I mean, there's been, and this is the thing when we talk cool climate, there's been years where our harvest, like actually physically picking the grapes doesn't end until Thanksgiving. So, I mean, those years you have active fermentations going into December, which just sounds insane, but it can happen. Yeah. And are you kind of holding your breath at that point, hoping that the rains don't come? Or are you as basically, are you able to look at weather patterns and say, okay, um, there are there any surprises, I guess, is, is what I'm asking. Yeah, we have, it's so interesting here. So in those really cool years, the greater risk for us is actually a frost. Oh. And there's been some years where harvest yeah. will end with a punctuation mark with the frost. In those other years, a year like 2020, you know, you worry about other things like heat. So it just, you know, it just depends on, on the season. And that's really our job is to, to, you know, to be able to really keep an eye on what's happening in every single vineyard, be able to adapt the best that we can. So, I mean, over the course of our career, you know, we've really modified our leafing strategies to keep the grapes protected, you know, so they have protection if it does get a little bit warm. If it stays cool, we have those winds that roll through in the afternoon to kind of keep everything really healthy. Um, but I mean, our, our, our end goal is to really just be adaptable. And the idea, and I think it reflects it in the bottle here, is we want to express the season. So if yeah. we were taking the 2017, it'd be a different one. And that's really intentional. So even though this is a blend of different vineyards, which we like to do, we love the idea of having one wine, which encompasses the Santa Rita Hills as a region. Mm -hmm. So this features sites kind of spotted throughout the Appalachian on different soil types, different expositions. And the, the goal there, again, is to have just that really, I mean, big picture view of what Santa Rita Hills tastes like. Can we pull up that map again so we can kind yeah. of see exactly where, uh, where you're talking about? And... Um, as, as you're doing that, I just, I would love to talk a little bit about smells and tastes of this wine, because if you're not drooling and you're watching this video, then maybe I'm doing something wrong, because this wine is delicious. Um, but, you know, all sorts of, I think where you get a little bit more of that, that bright, 
um, you know, sweet cherry, a little bit of florals. Here I get more of that like perfectly, that perfect Bing cherry, um, you know, a little bit of violet, but you know, definitely not, uh, definitely a wine that like has some savory elements too. And then that, that brininess, that saltiness, so that um, almost like an, an iron uh, smell and flavor that I'm getting. I'm so glad you're picking up on that. That is just, that is quintessentially Santa Rita Hills. <laughs> so you see on the larger portion showing the entire county, Santa Rita Hills sits in the far Southwest corner. And then if you look on the bigger map and I'm kind of rolling my cursor around to show it, so the San Rita Hills AVA is defined by much of the same trends as the rest of the San Ynez Valley, which is the east-west mountains that run parallel. So we have a mountain range, the Prisma range that runs a little bit north, and the San Ynez to the south. And the San Rita Hills is actually named after a set of hills that runs east to west through the AVA. And I should quickly mention, you were calling it San Rita Hills. If you see on a label or you see on the map, there's an abbreviation, STA. Mm -hmm. It's an old school abbreviation of Santa. So Star Rita Hills is actually pronounced Santa Rita Hills, as you look at that. And it is named after that beautiful geographic hillsides that come right in there. And the vineyards in, in, the, in the glass here really span, a, like I said, a broad reach kind of across the AVA. From west to east, we feature Radian, uh, which is that diatomaceous earth vineyard, Bent Rock, this beautiful rocky vineyard right next to it, La Rinconada and Sanford and Benedict, you know, from the, the kind of historical core of Santa Rita Hills, Fiddlesticks Vineyard. And then heading a little further east, we have the certified organic vineyards of Spear and Donica, two really new vineyards on the eastern side of Santa Rita, and John Sebastiano. So for us, I mean, just this, this tremendous patchwork quilt of some of the best vineyards in the AVA. And the blend is intentional. So sometimes with Pinot Noir, you know, there's so much emphasis on single vineyards. I think that it's important to mention that blending can be some incredible tool for Pinot Noir as well. So it's just a matter of, of, of how that's done. And for us, you know, it's not the kitchen sink thing. I think sometimes with Pinot Noir, people think of that hierarchy of Burgundy and they think that, you know, a Grand Cru that has a vineyard name is going to be more special than an Appalachian wine. Uh, but here, that's that's not the case. I mean, we definitely love our single vineyard wines, but we love the concept of blending because what it allows is it allows to take the best bits of each of these different vineyards, which are exceptional in their own right, mm -hmm. and bring them in something that brings an orchestral effect. So I love the music mm -hmm. analogy where, you know, the, the single vineyard is the soloist, you know, something that just has that pitch perfect purity, where the Santa Rita Hills Pinot Noir is something that's an orchestra. You get so much complexity from those different sites. It's a perfect analogy. And there is so much complexity in this wine. I think even as I go back to it and I'm, I'm tasting uh, all the things that I had talked about before, you know, more things come out and more things come out. And I've only had this in glass for, I don't know, 15 minutes now. I'm sure more things will continue to come out. But um, your approach for making this wine, I mean, how is it, I assume it seems, sees some level of oak. Um, we talked about when this was harvested. So is your approach the same vintage to vintage um, or does it change? Some things are similar. And the, the similarity would be that the focus for us really begins in the vineyard. So we're out in the vineyard constantly throughout the growing season, each of these different vineyards collaborating with the growers there. Um, very hands-on approach. In many cases, we're doing per acre farming that allow us to institute our own techniques. So at a number of these ranches, like John Sebastiano and Sanford, we pay, we pay extra so that our sections are organically farmed. You know, So we're really hands-on in the viticultural aspect. And then at harvest time, everything is done by taste. You know, so we'll monitor the sugars and the acids to kind of have historical records. But we really want to, at the end of the day, when you pop up in a bottle of wine, you want that deliciousness to come out of the glass. So we believe that our job is to kind of watch that in the vineyard and taste the fruit. And just like you would if you're actually picking a beautiful strawberry out of the garden or you know, tomato, that perfect moment of ripeness is actually really critical. Mm -hmm. So everything is kind of picked at the right moment, hand harvested in really small lots, uh, fermented and aged separately in the cellar. We prefer to use native yeasts. Uh, we do some stem inclusion, but that varies vintage to vintage. So we just kind of, we literally, that's a sensory thing as well. We'll, we'll taste and smell the stems. And uh -huh. if we have this beautiful savory characteristic, the little forest floor, a little cinnamon and clove, we'll incorporate them. If the grapes are really perfectly ripe, but the stems are a little green, then we'll destem the grapes. So again, there's no dogma to that. It's a, we, we think it's important, you know, much like as a sommelier, you'd pick a different wine to match a different course. We think that the winemaking techniques should be kind of adjusted a la minute to the season into the vineyard. And that. then, you know, once the fermentation's done, same thing with oak. We feel like sometimes new oak is a really beautiful thing for Pinot Noir. Other times an older barrel will really allow the fruit to shine. So in this particular vintage, this wine just has a little teeny bit, kind of a kiss of new oak, about 10%. And that, that ranges widely. You know, we've bottled Pinot Noirs up to 70% new oak down to near zero. So it just depends on the season and it depends on, on, the, on the, the vineyard as well. 
Yeah, there, I mean, it's such a pure expression of the grape. You do get a little bit of that spiciness, like a touch of the, the clove, the cinnamon, the cinnamon, the, the cardamom, uh, you know, just a little bit of forest lore. But I think, you know, for me, um, I, I can't help myself because I think this is, it, it was always my job to try to make it relatable for consumers. So if I'm thinking about consumers that are only familiar with Burgundy, you know, where would their minds be? And I think, you know, it, it has the intensity of something that you might expect from like a Chevrolet Chamber 10, but the sexiness and the 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 liveness of a Chambon Musini, you know, that, that round softness. Um, but it is distinctly California and, uh, as we said before, distinctly Santa Barbara um, with that gorgeous sort of iron rich salinity, um, the brightness, but the intensity as well of the fruit. That's so well described. Cheers. <laughs> 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 and that is rough. I mean, that's that's a huge goal. I think it's easy when talking about Pinot Noir to default to talking about Burgundy. But as you've mentioned, and I love that you said this, we now in California have these regions that are reaching you know this level of maturity where you know you can talk about you know Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir and really distinguish that from the San Angelo Highlands or okay. from you know the Santa Rita Hills. And I think that it's really phenomenal now that we have that ability to have these distinctions coming from those places. And while I think it's important to be inspired by Burgundy, in no ways, you know, are we trying to mimic that. You know, we're trying to make the most Santa Rita Hills expression of Pinot Noir that we can. Well, I think you've done an incredible job and I could sit and drink this all day. Um, if we have the time, which I will later. Um, but we're gonna, we should taste the Syrah because the Syrah is, uh, as you said, not the most planted variety like, like Pinot Noir, but certainly a, a big contender in the Santa Barbara County. Yeah, and I should mention um, we did uh, a some we did a little uh, live on Central Coast, which Santa Barbara is a part of. Um, we just sort of segmented it out for the purposes of this this discussion, because as I'm sure you're discovering, um, you know, not that all of the other regions within the Central Coast don't deserve their own uh, moment to shine, but uh, especially when you're talking about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, uh, I really felt like Santa Barbara needed a, a, a deeper dive uh, for the purposes of what we're doing. So, because I, yeah, I think that's one of those things is, you know, Central Coast is such a large region. Yeah. And I mean, traveling from Santa Cruz all the way down to Santa Barbara, there's definitely very, very distinct nuances in so many different areas as we as we're seeing this one too. For sure, yeah, and you know, even even region to region. Um, within the actual regions, there are there is such a diversity of styles and microclimates, and and certainly trying to boil these regions, even the smaller ones, down to just a few different wines. Um, you know, in some ways, doesn't do it a service, but also um, we love to find things that are representative of what's happening in each respective place. Yeah, and good introduction. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go to the pairing 2017 Syrah um, again. So this was a wine that you recommended, but also a wine that I was very familiar with having had this wine on my list back in New York a million years ago. And I put it on the list because it's one of these great wines that comes in, I think, at twenty five dollars a bottle and it's got great pedigree. So um, <laughs> Yeah, so we'll dive into to why this wine is um, a little bit different than I think, um, well, not different, but uh, a wine that is interesting from the standpoint of it comes from uh, some very uh, highbrow, uh, very expensive producers, both in Napa and in Santa Barbara. So, um, wow, look at the color of this wine, huh? You're not going to confuse this with Pinot Noir. <laughs> no. uh, is Pinot Noir yes, yes, yeah, Syrah is a completely different animal. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So, so why the pairing? Why this wine? So <clears throat> I thought that when we talk about Santa Barbara, we talk about diversity mm -hmm. again with the, with the different climatic zones and mm -hmm. the differential amount of ocean influence. <clears throat> Syrah is a grape that is so well adapted to the coldest of the cold and the warmest of the warm spots in Santa Barbara. This happens to come kind of from the center of the valley. So as you mentioned, I mean, the pairing has really, really great pedigree and you didn't mention it, but it's owned by the same folks who own Screaming Eagle, a little winery in Napa, and then a, a project around here called the Honada. Um, so, and these grapes actually come from the Honada Vineyard, which is in Ballard Canyon. So one of the AVAs, the real heart of the San Inez Valley. And what it's known for is, you know, when we, we talk about Santa Barbara, we talk about a cool climate and we talk about the east west mountain ranges. Ballard Canyon is a bit of an exception where it actually is a teeny little canyon tucked between two north-south trending ridges. Mm. So it sits as a slightly warmer climate micro pocket. And I mean, again, in the scheme of the, of the world, it would be moderate climate. It's by no means hot. Um, but around here, Syrah does incredibly well there because of that kind of combination. Sandy soils, 
There's some limestone in Ballard Canyon as well. <clears throat> and just kind of just that Goldilocks amount of heat and sunlight with cool nights and fog. And I think that one of the reasons that, you know, you mentioned this as well, and I'll talk about it is that Syrah is a grape that, you know, for, for people who are seeking value, <clears throat> Santa Barbara in general, it's kind of under the radar. And in some ways we don't want to talk about it. We actually really want to lead with quality, but truly there's incredible, incredible quality to price ratios abounding in Santa Barbara from the most expensive wines to the least. And this one, I just think is a wine that just over delivers on absolutely every level. I mean, it shows quintessentially what Santa Barbara Syrah is. I mean, again, I mean, I'll let you describe it because you do it so beautifully, but to <laughs> me, it's just that magical combination of fruit, earth, you know, that kind of sweet and savory that Syrah does so well together. Yeah. Well, yeah. and Syrah for me is always like a meal in a glass. Like I, yeah. I it's like all, all of your, if you put together a beautiful composed dish, it would, that would be Syrah. Um, and that it always has like, if you, if you took a steak, you threw it in the grill and then you got like a great blackberry compote and then some fresh herbs to go over top of it. And maybe like, you know, a little side of um, something, something nice and rustic and green that was kind of charred up. Like that would be Syrah, like no matter, kind of no matter where you get it from in some capacity, that's going to be the breakdown. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's also one of the things that makes it such a magical grape because it has this incredible flexibility. I mean, it, it has the power for somebody who loves full throttle wines like Cabernet Sauvignon or, you know, Red Zinfandel. But at the same point in time, and I think this wine does this so well, the aromatic complexity in here almost reminds me of Pinot Noir in the sense that, I mean, it just has incredible fireworks aromatically. And texturally, the tannins are so precise, you know, they're bold, but they're precise. And so they sort of sit in the middle of the mouth in a way that is really, really fine. And that, that to me defines, you know, when you think about Syrah from so many different parts of the world, it can be so many different things, you know, from like just the most gamiest, meatiest in the Rhone to the most, you know, boldest Barossa style. Mm -hmm. Barbara, I think, sits in the center point that just brings a, a really wonderful balance to it, where you do have some of those elements, but it's not one or the other dominating. They tend mm -hmm. to work harder. Yeah, it's it's right in that cross section, and I think I mean uh, that speaks to the other two wines too. It is its own thing, and if you took elements from both of those places, from uh, from Cote Roti or Cornas, uh, and then from the Barossa, and you kind of threw them together, that would be kind of where we are right now. So um, I'm sure I'm going to have purple teeth in just about three yeah. seconds because it's <laughs> so inky. Um, but that's great. I mean, this is you know classic color for Syrah, so that you know that beautiful um, those purple hues, those violet hues. Um, but to your point, those tannins, uh, which is what we love so much about Syrah, not overwhelming, but there, you know, more than, you know, but not quite as intense as maybe you might get from like a really heady Cabernet or a Petite Syrah. Um, exactly. It just kind of falls right in the middle. Um, and then aromatically, just explosion all over, you know, you get that great charcuterie, that gaminess, that rosemary, a little bit of sage, and then big, bright, um, dark black fruits, and then purple, purple flowers. Uh, and that all sort of translates right onto the palate. And and what I love is that, you know, for as, as intense a wine as this is, uh, aromatically and on the palate, it also has really great acidity and brightness so okay. that it kind of cleans up after itself. So it doesn't feel like it's it's weighty. Um, and I have had the Honada wines, I've had the uh, Le Song, uh, S-A-N-G-R-E, it's a Le Songre, um, or Le Songre. Uh, and and same thing, ageable wines that you know sort of lose that baby fat that we're getting in this wine today, but 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 keep that balance, keep that intensity, um, but still have the ability to clean up after itself, even with age or even at a, a young point in its life like this wine. Exactly, and I think that's one of the things that Santa Barbara does so well. I mean, people always ask, you know, when should they drink Santa Barbara wines? And I always say it depends on what you like because <laughs> they have this ability. They're so gorgeous in their youth like this. I mean, a 2017 that's just showing brilliant, brilliant fruit and just that slight just hint of starting to actually kind of round itself out. You kind of mentioned a little baby fat still, but they're wines that can age gorgeously. I mean, the best of the Santa Barbara wines can age for decades, you know, effortlessly. But the fun thing, and I think this is one of the things that makes it so great, you know, for folks who are either, you know, getting into Santa Barbara wines or a long time connoisseurs of the wines, mm -hmm. the drinking window is wide. There's no right or wrong. It kind of depends on what you're in the mood for. If you want something fresher, drink something young. If you want something a little bit more interesting and more savory, drink something that has a decade under its belt, you know, but again, there's, there's no, no time in that sequence where you have to keep your hands off of it, which I think is the best of both worlds. Brandon, what's the oldest Santa Barbara wine you've had? That is a great question. And I'm trying to think of the actual specific vintage, but for me, I've had a number of um, Santa Maria Valley uh, Pinot Noirs going back well into the seventies. Oh, cool. And I've had the inaugural vintages from Sanford and Benedict uh, mm -hmm. across all of the flavor. They actually used to grow a Riesling and Cabernet out there, if you can believe it. Oh, very cool, yeah. So we, we even had a chance to taste those, um, which 
sometimes are informative in terms of how you refine. I mean, you look at Pinot Noir and those are the things that Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are just aging unbelievably well. I mean, so, you know, wines, so I think, I guess at the time, the oldest wine that I would have had from the time I was tasting it was about 40 years old. And that was a Pinot Noir, uh, which was literally, I mean, it was so elegant, um, but it wasn't over the hill. I mean, it, it was it was savory in the best of ways, so silky. I think that's the thing that really comes with time is, you know, in Santa Barbara, we have that texture, which you've so eloquently mm -hmm. talked about in all the different wines. That texture element is really phenomenal kind of in the youth. But as time goes on, particularly with Pinot Noir, they just get more delicate and more graceful and a little more lacy. And uh, yeah, really, really fun wines at that point. What is your uh, favorite thing? I mean, we're drinking Syrah right now. So between Syrah, Pinot and Chardonnay, if you're having like a backyard barbecue or a backyard dinner with these three wines, um, what are you cooking? Or what are you ordering? Okay. Because there's so much great food. There is great food. So, and for each of the wines, I'll spot kind of a, a few of my favorites. Okay. Um, for me with Chardonnay, and we're, we're, again, we're so spoiled having so many great farmers <laughs> in our area. Yeah. Um, but with Chardonnay, anything with corn. So I love to do, in summertime, I'll do kind of a polenta with fresh corn right on top, Parmesan cheese, and just if, if we have them, if they're coming into season yet, chanterelle mushrooms. Um, Ooh, yeah. Chardonnay, that just, that's just the, my, my all time favorite pairing. Oh, as soon as you said chanterelle mushrooms, that like, you know, chanterelles always have like a little bit of a sweetness uh, to them. And they're so they're kind of buttery mushrooms as well. But yeah. and um, they grow in the, in the oak groves in Santa Barbara County. So it is one of the things that, you know, they don't come every year, but when they come, I mean, uh, we celebrate. Totally. Spot on. All right. Uh, Pinot. And for Pinot Noir, ooh, I mean, that's one that the, the pairing possibilities, as you know, are essentially endless in this. <laughs> so much. And what I would do with Pinot Noir, uh, I would actually do a sort of summery risotto. Um, you know, something that's a little bit on the lighter side. Still, I guess I'll carry on the mushroom theme. If we had the chanterelles, I'd have them with two horses. But you know, something that brings that mix of earthiness and sweetness, which complements that same thing that's in the wine. Yeah, and as we're getting into squash season, um, you know, all of those cool, like roasteds, I've got a couple squash inside from my great CSA box down the street, and they just keep throwing squashes in there. And I'm like, I don't know how to make these, but I just keep throwing them up, throwing them in the oven, and putting some olive oil, some pepper, and it seems to be doing okay. Perfect. Oh my god. <laughs> so you just some you know. Yeah, one of my favorite Thanksgiving pairings is you know Santa Barbara Pinot with a stuffed, stuffed squash. I mean, it just oh. is spot on. Yeah. It's so funny you say that because many years ago, um, just as I was starting to get into wine, uh, kind of at the moment when I discovered Santa Barbara Pinot and Chardonnay, my family was hosting Thanksgiving and uh, I walked into the wine shop and they had um, they had Domaine Delacote, uh, or so, I'm sorry, Sandy wine, Sandy Pinot Noir, and then Liquid Farm Chardonnay. And I was oh. like, I don't know if everybody else is going to like this, but I'm going to get it anyway. <laughs> and to your point, it was such a magical pairing for Thanksgiving to have both the Chardonnay and the Pinot because such food friendly and delicious wines. And I think for people that maybe lean a little bit more old world, uh, it fits the bill. And then for people who lean a little bit new world, it also fits the bill. So, you know, kind of. Really in there. And then uh, and then Syrah. I mean, we could go a million ways with this, and you're, I think you're just going to make me hungry talking about it. But we'll yeah, I mean, and this is, Syrah is the most difficult one because again, there's so many different ways to go, and I'd sort of give a nod to two different things on this. So I think what I would say, and I, part of this is, is speaking for myself, and part of this is speaking more generally. I don't eat meat, but for folks who do, with the pairing Pinot Noir, throw a burger on the grill, um, you know, lamb chops, I mean, something like that. Yeah. Something a char on like you mentioned mm -hmm. um, and then on the side of that for this particular wine one of my absolute favorite time favorite things to do when i'm drinking it in this season kind of summer going into fall santa barbara syrah because that acidity that you mentioned it has the most unbelievable pairing ability with tomatoes mm. so one of my favorite things is the heirloom tomato salad a little olive oil a little basil a teeny little bit of garlic and then if you can find it some great burrata or some mozzarella or something like that and that with this Syrah is just fireworks. I mean, it's really because that kind of herbal nature of the basil, the sweetness and the acidity of the tomatoes. Yeah. It's an unusual pairing because usually you think it's kind of or heavier, but it is phenomenal with this wine. Yeah, no, I'm sure it, it gives it a great dimension in a way that, you know, those heirloom tomatoes are so beefy and can almost like substitute as a meat. But um, it, when, as soon as you said herbal, I, I was thinking in my mind, I was like, wow, all of a sudden, all of this herbaceous, all of this, like, uh, it's a combination of, like, black licorice or, like, a little bit of, like, anise and uh, amaro. And then also this great herbaceous, this, like, 
all, it's not quite eucalyptus, um, but it's like almost there. It's kind of like green and minty. Exactly. Yeah. And Syrah in our area can have that. You know, there's actually mm -hmm. a compound called Rotondone and Syrah, which is super geeky. That's the kind of cracked peppery thing. Yeah. But also found in certain strains of rosemary or basil. So, I mean, you mentioned mm -hmm. that kind of resinous nature to it. So yeah. I think that's one thing that it, it's really, really fun in the wine because it just, it, it's subtle, but it's just enough to bring this really cool complexity to the wine. Yeah. I always say for people who are just starting to get into wine and trying to to train their palates to to identify different aromas. Syrah is such a fun wine to do that with because there's so much that you can look for and find. And so if yeah. you sit there, um, you know, with a couple different things in front of you, if you've got a little charcuterie, if you've got some some herbs, and if you've got uh, some like some cracked pepper, it's fun to use Syrah as sort of your your go go to to start that that journey down assigning the words to things you smell, and it's such a fun grape to do that with. That's perfect. Yeah. Ooh, well, um, what's up? What's up next for you? What's going on? I mean, are you you've got a little bit more harvest going on or are you about done? Yeah, so we're about 75% of the way through in terms of picking. Uh, we did a lot of Pinot Noir picking last week. So the winery has just tons of beautiful fermenters of Pinot Noir right now. And we just started picking Syrah a couple days ago. So for us, the kind of that kind of tail end of harvest is into Syrah and Grenache. Mm. And at this point in time, I mean, we are just counting our blessings. We feel really, really fortunate that this this season, 2020, for, for so many of us, been such a rocky year. But the vines don't watch the news. The growing season has been really, really phenomenal. <laughs> and, you know, we've just, we've, crossing our fingers, been able to kind of dodge some of the challenges with the smoke and whatnot. Um, so we haven't had any nearby fires. I'm knocking on wood right now. So at this point in time, we're just kind of keeping an eye, tasting the berries, and, you know, looking to have a great couple of weeks um, harvesting Syrah. I wish you all the best. And I love that the vines don't watch the news. That's right. They do not. So it's our job to make sure that they don't watch the news. Um, but Brandon, I know you are are in the middle of harvest, as you just said. I know you've got a lot going on. This is literally the busiest time of year for you. So I can't thank you enough for taking the time to break down Santa Barbara in this way. I feel like I just got a crash course in it in the best way possible. And I hope everyone watching feels that way as well. Um, and again, Brandon, uh, Brandon is Dragonette seller. So um, if you uh, want to find these wines, you certainly can. And I recommend all of them. I think I've had most of your wines in the portfolio at this point. And like I said, we'll be tasting this, the Sauvignon Blanc Blanc tomorrow with Aida's recipe that she hasn't shared with us yet, but she will. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So thank you so much. And for those of you who, who are watching and have been enjoying the series, uh, this was supposed to be our last week, but I have great news. We have been picked up for a second season. Um, so <laughs> so we are, we're gonna be returning next week. Um, I can't say with whom and what we'll be talking about, we'll, but we'll be here same time, same place. Uh, and we have also been uh, continued for the Instagram live series. So I'll be continuing with Aida. So uh, if you wanna come and watch us, uh, eat and drink on on Instagram. That's the place to do it. If you want to learn a little something in the process, also the place to do it. But we'll also be doing that on Facebook uh, on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific. So um, thank you all so much for watching. Our this kind of wraps up California Wine Month, but really it's California Wine Year all the time because we both live in California and it's you know California wine is always around. So um, exactly. I'd like to just add a quick comment that for anybody who is planning a trip to Santa Barbara County, Santa Barbara County is open. Um, in, in terms of tasting, things are outdoors, but we're obviously a place that has beautiful weather nearly year round. Um, so just wanted to give everybody, obviously enjoy the wines wherever you are, but if you make your way out to California, we'd love to host you in Santa Barbara because it's a phenomenal, phenomenal place to visit. Oh, thank you so much for putting that out. Cause yes, the, the wine countries are open and it's a beautiful time of year. Um, so yes, please go visit Santa Barbara. Please, you know, even if you, even if it's a, a day trip or a weekend trip or whatever, get out to wine country. It's such a great escape. And and I am still due for a visit down there. So I'm sure I'll be seeing yeah, you. Next year. <laughs> but thank you again. And uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you for, for sharing all your great wines and knowledge with us today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And cheers in the meantime. All right. I'll see you later. Take care. Bye.